is understanding the word, allowing God's word to be applied in our lives. And that's what we see in the text that is before us. Titus chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 10 through 16. Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. Out of honor and respect of the reading of the Word of God, let me invite us to stand together. As we stand together, as I read audibly, Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, as we continue our journey through one of these wonderful texts that's called the Pastoral Epistles, let's read together as I read silently, audibly follow with me in your Scripture silently. Verse 10 and following, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Out of the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works... They deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Thank you, and we may be seated. I don't know of any other single unit of thought in all the Scripture that identifies the predators in the pulpit, the false teachers, any more than this text. Perhaps Second Peter chapter 2, a wonderful study, 22 verses in that text about the false teachers. But may I remind us, I believe the 21st century church is in trouble. I believe the 21st century church is in deep trouble. And I believe it for a number of reasons, but primarily for the lack of biblical, theological, doctrinal, foundational truth in relationship to what's being taught, what's being believed, what's being promulgated in families that attend some of these false doctrinally unsound, theologically shaky churches today. Not concerned. I believe I could simply say this with all authority. Most Christians are simply not concerned about solid doctrinal truth. Perhaps you've heard me use it as an illustration before. I've had the privilege down through the years of interviewing hundreds of people and asking them a very simple but yet profound question. What do you look for in a church? What are you seeking in a New Testament church? Overwhelming majority will say, a good music program. Secondly, in that lineup of priorities, they'll say, I'm looking for a church that has a good program for my child. Something where they can be entertained. Something where they can go on trips together. Something where they can go skiing and having sports together, etc., Others will say, I'm looking for a church where there's, they're friendly and where there are a lot of folks that are there. And even for those that I've interviewed and talked with about as seniors, I'm looking for a church where we can go on senior bus rides, where we can go on senior shopping trips together, et cetera, et cetera. Let me tell you, I've not had one, not a single one, that said I'm looking for a church with solid theological doctrinal preaching, not one. Our churches are in trouble today. The church in America, the 21st century church, is in deep, deep trouble. Most are looking for entertainment, entertainment. Most are looking for a place where there can be laughter and frivolity and a sense of happiness and joy rather than looking at it on the basis of what is sound theology. As a result of that, we have what I call immature, illiterate, ignorant, unlearned Christians today. And I'm saying that with all due respect for uh, those that have a relationship to the Lord. But they're babes in Christ. Babes in Christ. Most today 
No, John 3.16, perhaps two or three other verses, and as a result of that, you don't have to teach me anything about the Bible. I don't need to go to Sunday school. I don't need to be involved in church. I already know God. I'm saved. And as one told me a number of years ago, in doing a counseling session for pre-marriage, uh, trying to ascertain the relationship of the couple to the Lord, and the young lady lost as a green ball in high weeds. Picture that for <laughs> She said, I don't need to go to church. I can worship God. She said, I love fishing. Sunday's the only day I have to go fishing. I can go fishing. I can worship God on the boat. I said, let me ask you a question. You're reeling that fish in. You Are you saying, thank you, Jesus. I love you. It's, <laughs> is that what you're doing? Uh, no. The bottom line is there are a lot of folks today that think that somehow, some way, we can do without the local New Testament church, and there's no need for it. Immature. In this text... The Apostle Paul has assigned Titus with a responsibility of remaining on the island of Crete to appoint pastors, sound pastors. In fact, in the ninth verse, those holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's the purpose of having pastors in the pulpit that know the word of God. Doctrine of the sound. Pastors that are fully committed to the word, holding fast the, their faith that is reliable, trustworthy word of God. So why should this be done? Because they're false teachers. Now I can go for the balance of the day talking about the false teachers. I enjoy listening to them on radio and television. <laughs> I enjoy listening to, and as I tell those in the classroom, in the college, I enjoy critiquing preachers and I know that when I get to heaven the Lord Jesus will say son you remember when you said so and so you were wrong that doesn't mean that I believe that I'm all right on everything but I believe that we are in a society today where multitudes are preaching and teaching fables mythology uh, that which is not founded in the word of God and Titus has the responsibility of appointing faithful pastors that Crete why because of predators in the pulpits there are three things as we think on that subject that I want to call our attention in these moments that we have together. I want us to notice three things. The description of the false teachers recorded in verses 10 through 13. Secondly, the duty of faithful teachers reminded in verses 13 and 14. And the defilement of false teachers registered in verse 15 and 16. Notice, if you will, please, in verses 10, 11, 12, and 13, the description of the false teachers recorded. Notice, first of all, their characteristics reveal. So just how can we determine, how can we determine who is a false teacher? How can you make that decision? What is a false teacher? Notice the scripture says, for that is because there are many, that word many is the word megos. We get our word mega multitudes of unruly and disobedient. That is, uh, Paul is saying to Titus as he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God that they're refusing to preach and teach or submitting to the control of the Word of God, disobedient to the Scripture, disobedient to the Scripture. I don't know of anything that's any more onerous, if I can use that phrase to make a statement, any more onerous than to have a pastor, preacher, teacher spiritual leader, one that is preaching the word, to wrench a verse of scripture out of its context. If you're out of town for six months and you send a letter to your wife or vice versa, and you say, honey, I love you. I miss you. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I'm looking forward to being back with you in town. I'm coming back next week. You would not take one of those phrases and say, honey, I wonder what that means. And then you go ahead on a tangent as to what the word honey means. You know, the bees make it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Rather than looking at it in context of what is being said. There are multitudes today that are disobedient to the Scripture, to the Word of God. They have their own philosophies, their own beliefs, their own doctrines, their own teachings, and they're rebelling against the truth of the Word of God. They have some new revelation, some new doctrine. God has told them something or shown them something that no one else has seen. There's something unique and unusual they found in the Scripture that no one else has ever found. Not only are they disobedient to the Scripture, they are devoid of soundness. Notice it says, vain talkers, literally empty, worthless, vacuous, void. 
words that have no meaning whatsoever. They uh, will use impressive jangle, as I call it, the words with little or no sound doctrine or content, little or no biblical truth, using many words, emotional babble with no spiritual meat whatsoever, a lot of God talk. That fills the pulpits more than most would ever think today. You can watch some of these guys on television. Their jeans have the knees out. <laughs> They've got earrings in both ears and the nose. They're covered with tattoos. They might read a verse of Scripture and lay the Bible aside. And don't then go on a journey that you cannot tie to Scripture any place if your life depended on it. It is my philosophy and my belief that as the Word of God is properly preached and taught on Sunday, a Christian ought to be able to have that to hang on to Monday through Saturday in life and living. It ought to be the guidebook. It ought to be the uh, lamp. It should be that which is beneficial and a blessing. They're disobedient to the Scripture. They ha they're devoid in soundness. And thirdly, deceptive in speech. Deceptive in speech. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, you need not turn to it, but let me just read it for our edification, for the amplification of the text. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 14, that with henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Same thing is taking place today as in the uh, time of the Apostle Paul. They're deceptive, deceptive in speech. Why the God talk? Why the vain talking? Why the empty, worthless, impressive words? Simply to deceive the hearer. You know, God told me to tell you so and so. I've said multitude of times, God's never told me to tell you anything. God's word tells you and me what we ought to do. Simply put, they're saying, you know, I've just seen a vision. God has shown me things that you've never seen before. Uh, God wants you to have this or God wants you to have that. Uh, simply teaching and preaching heresy that cannot be tied to the Scripture. Notice the Scripture says in that 10th verse, they are of the circumcision. That is the Jewish teachers that come into the churches with the claim to be Christian and preaching and teaching false, theologically unsound truths from the pulpits. They're disobedient to the Scripture. They're devoid of soundness. They're deceptive in speech. But notice not only the characteristics revealed, but notice the charge recited in that 11th verse. What should you do with them? How should you respond? What ought to be the mindset on the part of Christians. The scripture says, whose mouths may be stopped. Perhaps could be stopped. Didn't say that, does it? It says, whose mouths must, it's needful, it's necessary, it's required, it's compelling to be stopped, the scripture says. That is silence. That word stop means to be silenced. It means to be bridled. It means to shut up. Paul is reminding Titus that the heresy, the false teachers are teaching and preaching the phony doctrine cannot continue. That's the reason he said to Titus they need to, he needs to appoint men in the pulpits with sound doctrine. I'll never forget Every time I use that word, I think of it. A number of years ago, passing through the backside of St. Augustine, the old section of St. Augustine, there was a church with a flag from pavilion there on the uh, front of the church, and they had a large letter board, and it says, We do not teach doctrine here. <laughs> the word doctrine means teaching. Sound doctrine means sound teaching. Sound doctrine means biblical teaching. But we do not teach doctrine here. And I thought, Lord, what do they teach? What are they doing? And yet there's the mindset somehow, some way that you can continue to allow false teaching to continue. We can't just sit in silence and allow these false teachers to delude, to divide, and to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Matthew, the seventh chapter, the 15th verse, touches on that very thing. Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Jesus said in Matthew, the seventh chapter, they look like the sheep on the outside. They look like a Christian when you see them. They talk like it. I use the term, they have the God talk. 
but on the inside, they're ravening wolves. What does it mean? They're dangerous, they're deadly, and will destroy the flock of sheep. Here, the scripture says, whose mouths must be, it's needful, it's necessary, it's required, it's compelling that they be stopped. The body of Christ is weak today because of false teachers in the pulpits that's uh, preaching and teaching pablum to very, at the very least. Not only do we see the characteristics revealed and the charge recited, but I want you to notice the conduct reviewed in the 11th verse. Who subvert, that word subvert means to undermine, to overthrow, to uproot, whole families, to subvert, to uproot, to destroy the theological doctrinal soundness in not only an individual mom and dad, but in the entire family. If mom and dad happens to be in a church where false theology is taught, it's going to be that which permeates the entire family and can destroy the entire family. In fact, in Second Peter Chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, that is secretly, surreptitiously, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, megas, multitudes, shall follow their pernicious, that means shameful, sinful ways, by reason of whom they the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned, that is false, phony, that word feigned is the word plastos, means a shell of the real thing, a with phony words make merchandise of you whose judgment not of a long time lingereth now not, and the damnation slumbereth, their damnation slumbereth not. The scripture is very, very clear as we study the scripture. And the Apostle Paul is speaking to that here as he's telling uh, Tim, uh, Titus what he needs to do in appointing pastors on the island of Crete. Their, the charge there is that they must be silenced. Why is that? Because they subvert whole families. Notice two or three things. First of all, they're damaging delusion. Damaging delusion. These false teachers are uprooting, contaminating, making spiritual bankrupt entire families. Entire families today, the false teachers are leading moms and dads and children down a dark path of doctrinal delusion, deception, and ultimate doom. It's frightening when you think about how many people today may feel that they're saved because they believed what some false teacher said, may believe that they've saved because they have spoken in uh, some unintelligible demonic utterances, that think that they're saved because they've been baptized, that think that they're saved because they give all the funds they can to the church, that think that they're saved because they've been told that this is all you need to do to be saved, and it's antithetical to the truth of the Word of God. Doctrinal delusion and deception brings ultimate doom. Those that will say, dancing in the church or the signs, miracles, and visions, uh, many ways to heaven, or there's no hell, or the sodomite LGBTQ agenda is okay. Some teach that there's no such thing as the virgin birth, and we talk about it today many times in Mormonism and in Jehovah's Witness and in uh, Catholicism and the cults. But ladies and gentlemen, I want us to understand they're not alone in that. It crosses all denominational lines today. It permeates all denominational lines. The false teaching, denominational leaders leading entire families away from biblical truth, teaching mythology and false doctrine. Not only do we see their damaging delusion, but notice the doctrinal deception in verse 11. Teaching things which they ought not. Teaching things which, that is teaching things that's contrary to the scripture. Teaching things that's not found in the word of God. There are a lot of folks today that will go to church wanting to be entertained, whether it has sound theological truth or not. I recall a number of years ago, while my mother was still living, the last 15 years of her life, she had Alzheimer's. The last five years of her life, she couldn't recognize anyone, family or otherwise. On one occasion, when we had gone back to visit with her, prior to getting into that ultimate stage before death, had the opportunity to sit with her and she had a little bookshelf in her living room. I reckon I get my love for books from her because she did. And she was shut in and could not go out. But two ladies would come by on Thursday and have Bible study with her. 
And I looked at some of the books, and I said, Mom, what is this? And she said, well, those ladies gave it to me. I said, do you realize it's the Mormon, I mean, the Jehovah's Witness cult? And she said, um, what, what do you mean? And I said, that's false teaching. And I explained to her some of the subtle false teaching that's found in that cult. I said, you don't need these books. She had three or four. She said, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm going to burn them. She said, but they would read from the Bible. They would read from the Bible. See, she loved the Lord, no question about it. She was anxious for Bible study and for Bible teachers in teaching, but did not recognize that what she was being taught was absolutely false doctrinal teaching. It was absolutely unholy, ungodly material that was being taught. Multitudes today that cannot recognize truth from error will be sold a bill of goods, as I call it, and will believe the devil's lie in that false teaching from the pulpits where predators are in the pulpits doing the teaching and the preaching that will lead multitudes of souls to be doomed in that place called hell. Their doctrinal deception, their dishonest desire. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? It's a fascinating question that we want to look at in just a moment. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verse 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they have such as serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their belly, own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of of the simple. It is so clear when you study the scripture. What is the approach? The approach is for filthy lucre. Notice their dishonest desire. And it's for filthy lucre. Why do these false teachers teach and continue to preach and to say these things that are dishonest doctrinally? Simply for the M-O-N-E-Y. In fact, in the scripture in First Peter, the fifth chapter, the second verse, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. I've said many times, and this is just me, what I call young blood theology. <laughs> you could take the money out of the pockets of the preachers for just one month, and you'd find about 90% of them decide that God's called them to sell cars, or God's called them to sell insurance. Or God's called them to go on the mission field. Something other than preaching. Never will forget a number of years ago, I just had an opportunity to do a revival meeting just south, this south of Atlanta, not too far from the uh, airport there, Forest Park, Georgia. And the pastor was there, seated about 2,000 people. They had about 200 people present. They had a church split about a year before I arrived. And uh, I preached uh, eight services, Sunday morning through Sunday morning. That was the uh, procedure then. Then it got down to several years later where it was preacher would call and say, could you come preach a revival? How long? He said, well, a Sunday morning, Sunday night. A weekend revival, you know. No such thing as a weekend revival, but they had devolved to that. But during the course of that week, that Thursday night in the invitation, the pastor came forward himself, made a recommitment of his life to the Lord and uh, told the people, he said, what you've heard this week is biblical preaching, and I want to apologize to you that I've not been doing that for the year that I've been here. And I was thankful for that. After returning back to Jacksonville the following week, I received a letter from him. The letter stated that he was looking to make a transition to another church. And he had a little footnote, P.S., I'm not interested in one of those little smaller situations. You understand, he was saying, I'm looking for something that's better pay than I'm presently getting. Now, there's nothing wrong with the pastor being paid if the church does that. In fact, the scripture says he's worthy of double honor. He is to be fed from the gospel, not going out selling shoes on the street corner to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. But if that is the focus and the goal and the ambition for any pastor in the pulpit, he is going to make sure that it does not offend anybody does not say what the scripture says because after all, someone that's giving, someone that's uh, coming on a regular basis might be offended by the truth of what he preaches from the pulpit if he preaches, thus saith the word of God. Most pastors are concerned about numbers, nickels, and noses. You understand that? 
They're concerned about making sure that their paycheck continues to come in. The scripture says here the false teachers are teaching. And I'm not saying that every pastor that makes a transition from smaller church to a larger church is because of the M-O-N-E-Y, though I think that most of the time it happens to be that very thing. But the scripture here, talking about those false teachers, they're doing it for filthy lucre's sake. This is the purpose. This is the reason. This is what they're doing. It's simply following that. It's the wealth. It's the position. It's the popularity. It's the power. 99% of these false teachers would cease today if what I call those which are the ignorant, immature, anemic, misguided believers would stop sending their dollars to them, these television preachers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Those that will say, send me $100, and I'll send you a 36 by 36 inch piece of white cardstock with my footprints outlined on the card. You slide that card under your bed, and every morning when you arise, you slide that card out, and you place your feet in my footprints, and then you demand God to give you what you want that day, making millions doing that. Multitudes, if you send enough money, they'll send you a green cloth. That green cloth ind indicative of green bikes, money. And it's been blessed by that preacher. And if you use that to wipe your brow every morning, God's going to put money in your bank every day. Multitudes simply believe that absolute garbage, if I may be prone and privileged to call it that. The characteristics reveal, the charge recited, the conduct reviewed. But notice... In verse 12 and 13, the confirmation recognized, Paul reminds Titus, one of these, uh, uh, these prophets, one of their own prophets, confirmed the character of the false teachers in the text. One of these that said this, one of themselves, that is, loose with the false teachers, even a prophet of their own said, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This is one, this is one of the uh, preachers at Crete, that's talking about the Christians and what is believed based on what they're being taught in the pulpit. Three things he says about them. They're deceptive, they're destructive, and they're devouring. Notice, they're deceptive, always liars, never honest, never preaching truth and the truth and word of God. Remember, Jesus said the false teachers, they are of the devil in John eight forty four. Second John chapter second John verses ten and eleven says this If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Multitudes today they're deceptive, false teachers. They're destructive, evil beasts that is wild, fierce in nature, uh, wicked, bad, destructive. I'm God saying this, I'm not. Yet there are a lot of folks today that will get a little uptight. If you say, that's a false teacher. Well, he preaches from the Bible. Well, he has 10,000 people in the audience. The mindset today is the larger the audience is more indication that he's from God and what he's saying must be good. And contrary is true. You remember the 12 spies that went out? Came back. Two said we believe God and the other said we don't. The majority is not necessarily always correct theologically and doctrinally. They're destructive. They're devouring. The scripture says slow bellies. What does that mean? Uncontrolled greed, desire. Remember, these false teachers did not uh, want to uh, reach the Christians with the gospel. They wanted to play on their uncontrolled greed and lust and wanting more and more. In fact, the scripture in Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3 illustrates that. For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. These false teachers would not exist today were it not for congregations and people and audiences wanting to hear something that tickles the ears. These false teachers could not continue to teach false doctrine and thrive from that were it not for those that are wanting to hear something new, something unusual, something unique, something different. You'd be surprised how many times I have some come to me and say, Pastor, I was on the Internet, 
And I found this, this, and this. One said on one occasion, they'd found an internet site that says, Rapture Ready. And wonder if I'd seen it. And I said, no, there's not about 100 of those sites that says Rapture Ready. And I took the particular one that that individual had said, and I looked it up, and it was absolutely fake, phony, false, absolute aberrant theology, nothing compared to the truth of the Word of God. Folks want to hear something, see something, find something that seems to be unique and different rather than simply, thus saith the word of God. The simplistics of what does the word of God say? What is the context? Who is it speaking to? How should we respond? What should we do in relationship to that? God's word is designed that we might have something to live by, something that will be the guide in the direction in our lives each and every day. Not something to tickle the ears, not something to just simply make one laugh, not something to cause one to be entertained, but something that should cause one to be convicted. Dr. Richard Land, many years ago, made the statement, doctrinal preaching is not designed of God to make one feel good, but to bring about conviction that leads to commitment of one's life. And the sooner we understand that as Christians, the more we can be uh, grown and developed in and through the Word of God. De they're deceptive, they're destructive, they're devouring. Not only to see the description of the false teachers recorded, but verses 13 and 14 see the duty of faithful teachers reminded. What is the duty? What is the responsibility of those that are faithful? Number one, notice in verse 13, the confrontation required. This witness, the word witness means testimony, is true, and it's referring to what's said in verse 12. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Scripture didn't say, Paul didn't say now, uh, Titus, when you find them like that, pat them on the back, say, I know you're doing a good job. I know that one day you'll evolve from that, and you'll be a better preacher, teacher than you are now. Just keep on doing what you're doing, and that's okay. That's not what he said they need to do. That's not what Paul instructed Titus to do. First of all, notice there must be the defending, defend the correct doctrine. Rebuke has the idea of confronting, correcting, convincingly so. It is a verbal reprimand and a reproof for a false teaching. Rebu rebuke sharply. That means to challenge, to chide, to severely, not politely, but pointedly correct false teaching. There are a lot of folks that have the philosophy today that you ought not to do that. You know, everybody's trying to do the best they can. We're all trying to see. And all, after all, all roads lead to heaven. That is not so at all. Not so at all. There are a lot of folks today that will say, well, you know, I made, I, 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 I listened to him. He speaks so good. I like to hear him. And, and after all, I understand what he says is not necessarily just what the Bible says. But after all, he's got a huge congregation. And after all, my child has a wonderful time in that play uh, ground that they have. After all, and going on with the rationale or irrationality as to why it's okay. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that it must be confronted and it must be rebuked, and it must be rebuked sharply. You recall in Revelation 2, verses 18 through 20, Jesus condemned the church at Thyatira for allowing false teachers to be in the pulpits. Defend correct doctrine. And secondly, defeat corrupt doctrine. This correction must be done sharply. That means pointedly, poignantly. Not tenderly, not gently, not uh, uh, some uh, clever way, not some calmness. But we need to not walk on eggshells, but correct it and say, this is wrong theology, wrong doctrine. I find it interesting on the radio broadcast, occasionally someone will call in and they want to join in the dialogue and discussion, and that's wonderful. They'll make a statement that I understand their statement is off in relationship to correct theological doctrinal teaching. So try to be careful with that, trying not to alienate the person, but at the same time correcting it. What you've said is correct, however, let me say this. What you said in relationship to that is not biblical truth. This is truth, and this is what we need to understand. Trying to give a little teaching along with the uh, insightful interest that they have in the contact through the broadcast. This correction and confrontation must be done directly. The false teacher is a good person, some will say. Just teaching error. False doctrine must be defeated by the truth of the Word of God. Believers must not listen to or follow or allow that to continue. 
Notice in verse 9, let's back up for a moment again. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. That is the purpose of sound doctrine is to confront the false teacher, the word there, gainsayer, talking about the false teachers. Sound doctrine ought to confront and rebuke the false doctrinal teaching that is in so many pulpits today. Perhaps you say, well, as an individual believer, how can I do that? I've had people to sit with me privately and say, my pastor is teaching false doctrine. Generally, the last two, three, four, five that I've talked with on that, their pastor is teaching Calvinism from the pulpit. And the question is, what should I do? I said, don't embarrass him or yourself. Go to him privately and walk over those things with him. If Calvinism being taught from the pulpit, I'll say to anybody hearing this in this room and beyond these walls, find a church where doctrinal truth is taught. Calvinism says that you can't do anything about your relationship to God. God, before the foundation of the world, has already decided who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, and you can't make a decision. In fact, uh, John MacArthur recently on national radio laughed at that. He said, for any church, for any preacher, for any Christian to think that you can just say a few words and say, Jesus, come into my heart and think you're going to heaven, you're lost because praying that prayer is works, and you're not saved by works. God's already done that for you. Yet he doesn't realize how he bifurcates his theology when he says then, if you've had one of my books and you've read this and you've come to faith in Christ, let us know. Well, how do you come to faith in Christ if God's already done it? And yet pulpits across denominational lines today are filled with the lie of Calvinism. There are a whole lot of other things that they're teaching also. You've got to speak in tongues to evidence that you're saved. You've got to be baptized to be saved. Hell is not real. It's just the last stopping point before you get to heaven, according to Rob Bell in his book, Love Wins. There's so many false doctrines and theologies out there that it will fill this room if we had time to simply uh, uh, look at them and analyze them. Not only the confrontation required, but I want you to notice the consequences realized in verse 13 and 14. What's the desired end? What's the desired purpose for the confrontation, for the rebuke and the correction? The threefold, number one, doctrinal soundness. Number two, dispelling speculation. And three, discarding spurious rules. Doctrinal soundness. Verse 13, that they may be sound in the faith that they may have healthy, sound doctrinal beliefs and teachings. Sound doctrinal teachings comes from the Word of God. That's the truth, not man's philosophies, not some ideological bent, not some denominational dogma, but what does the Word of God say? Doctrinal soundness. That's the consequences realize that we're looking for. Dispelling speculation, verse 14. Not giving heed, that's attention, listening to fables. The word fables is the little Greek word mythos. Better understood, myths. Not giving heed, attention, listening to fables, myths, erroneous heresies, false man-made teachings. An angel appeared to me, foot of the bed. He was about nine foot tall, long blonde hair. Jesse Duplantis said. <laughs> he said he realized it was Jesus. And he talked with Jesus, and he was there walking the streets with Jesus. And finally he said to Jesus, listen, I want to talk with the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of walking with you. I want to talk with the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, I'll dismantle the Buckman Bridge and reconstruct it in your backyard. And yet there are a lot of folks that believe stuff like that coming out of the mouths of the false teachers. The purpose for confronting sharply is to have doctrinal soundness and to dispel any speculation, not giving heed attention to that kind of speculation. We must stay in the word and be content in the word and confront the false teachers because verse by verse in context teaching and preaching is all that God would have us to do. I don't have any authority outside the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Doctrinal soundness, dispelling speculation. But notice in that 14th verse, discarding spurious rules and commandments of men. That is literally man-made spurious 
counterfeit rules, fake, sham teachings. Turn from the truth is literally what is being challenged in the text. In fact, in Colossians 2, verses 4 and verse 8 says this. Chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 8. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain deceit after the rudiments of man and after the, not, notice that, after the traditions of man and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Multitudes today would have you to believe their vain jangling and their teaching that is in conflict with the word of God. Colossians 2 verse 21 and 22 says this. They're giving these rules and regulations. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are perished with using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. It is, you've got to eat certain foods. You've got to have the Daniel diet. You know, Daniel just lived off vegetables. <laughs> there are those that will come up with all kind of rules and speculations that's not founded in context in the Word of God. And as a result of that, we'll make, uh, uh, as I call it, jello out of the Word of God rather than it being sound doctrinal teaching. Spurious rules and regulations. Today you can hear the false teacher saying and preaching, you must talk in tongues to be able to reveal salvation. You must be baptized to be saved. You must worship on Saturday. You must eat certain foods. Rules and rules and rules and regulations without biblical authority. The ultimate purpose of confronting the false teachers with their false doctrine is to point people to the truth of the word of God. To point people to Jesus and Jesus only. Not to the messenger, but to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The description of the false teachers recorded, the duty of the faithful teachers reminded. But I want you to notice as we close in verse 15 and 16, the defilement of the false teachers registered. I find it fascinating as I study this text that the closing two verses of this unit of thought give some very, very poignant, powerful statements. Notice their characters rejected in verse 15. The Bible declares these false teachers stand absolutely condemned in their character and in their conduct. Notice their disbelieving heart. Unto the pure, that is to the clean, the holy, all things are clean, holy, and pure. But unto them that are defiled, that means polluted, and unbelieving, that means lost, there is nothing that is clean or holy or pure. Paul declares that these false teachers are defiled. They're lost, not saved, not Christians. They're lost without Christ. Notice not only do we see their disbelieving heart, but their defiled mind. But even their mind and conscience is defiled, unclean. Their intellect, their thinking, their emotions, their judgment is defiled and polluted because of sin, because of lostness. They defile conscience, and conscience is defiled. No longer, it's a fascinating term there, no longer will there be any conviction in their hearts because of telling a lie or preaching things that are unbiblical. Their entire conscience is totally defiled. My bride asked me on one occasion when we were in discussion about some of the false teachers and false teachings, and that question was asked, are they deceived or are they simply deceivers? I said, both. They're lost and deceived. As a result of that, they're deceiving others, and they come to the point of having total defiled conscience that it does not bother them at all to stand in the pulpit and preach and teach something that's antithetical to the truth of the word of God. Their defiled conscience. No longer do these false teachers sense any guilt for false doctrine. That's the reason they handle God's word so loosely. The false teachers simply are polluted and perverted in their entire inner person. They believe their own self-deception. Notice in that 16th verse, their conduct repudiated, and there are four things very quickly in that 16th verse, pointing out the conduct repudiated. First of all, their deceitful claim. They profess, notice, they profess that they know God. 
but by, that's the little word dia, means through their works, their teachings, their deeds, they deny him. They're hypocrites. They're lost, lost, lost. Now the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 from the prison cell talks about different ones preaching, some out of contention and some out of truth. But he says, nevertheless, the gospel is going forth. There are a lot of folks that will listen to a false teacher, a false preacher, and somehow, some way, through the miracle power of the Holy Spirit of God, they will say yes to Jesus Christ, and they will truly be saved. But once they're saved, they want to find the meat of the word. If they can remain under false teaching and false preaching and false theology and false doctrine, they've perhaps never been saved. It's an impossibility for a saved person to be satisfied with false teaching, false theology, and false doctrine coming from the heart and life of a lost preacher that's preaching and teaching fables, mythology. Their deceitful claim, they profess, that is, they lie to themselves. I made a little note. They're lost, lost lost, lost, and that's evidenced by their deeds and their works and what they're saying and doing. And secondly, their detestable conduct. Being abominable, that word abominable means a vile stench in the nostrils of God, in the sight of God, they are absolutely abominable. This is the expression that God says and talks about with his disgust for the false teachers, the hypocrite teachers. Yet some bleeding heart liberals today will say, oh, they aren't that bad. After all, they quote the scripture. After all, all they read from the scripture. One of the so-called evangelists of a number of years ago, perhaps you saw him on television. His name just started reappearing in some doctrinal theological diatribe. But he would stand at his piano, just banging that piano as he was giving the prophecies. And in 2009, the prophecy was that God is going to save all of America. A great flaming revival is going to cover America. America is going to all be saved. It didn't. Old Testament, a false teacher with a false prophecy should be taken out to the city gates and stoned. So some need to be glad that we don't institute the penalty as is found in the Old Testament. But multitudes today will preach and teach that which is abominable to God, stench in the nostrils of God. They will paraphrase or quote partial text. Not only do we see their deceitful claim and their detestable conduct, Notice their disobedient conduct, verse 16. Being abominable and disobedient, the scripture says. Literally refusing to obey God, refusing the truth of God's word, refusing to do what God's word says. They're doing that because they want to please people and to receive the reward financially from what they're saying. They are mishandling the scripture and they're doing so in their disobedience to God because they're lost, the scripture says. And finally, notice their disqualified conduct. And unto every, not some, not a few, but to every good, kelos, honorable, truthful work, reprobate, reprobate, unfit, unqualified, disapproved, disqualified, or as the scripture would call it, ah, dokimos, disapproved. Disapprove. God says these false teachers must be rebuked. They must be reproved. They must be rejected because they are disqualified. And in their disqualification, they're an abomination in the nostrils of God. God says they're unfit. They're rejected to carry out the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Now, all of this is being said in the context with Paul placing Titus on the Isle of Crete in order to appoint pastors that can refute, that have the ability to confront false doctrine and false teachers. I've just said so long and for so many years, be careful 
who you follow. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you read behind. There are a lot of folks that will read a lot of books written by a lot of authors. I can take about five minutes and critique any book. I want to look at the dust jacket, who wrote it, his theological credentials, where he went to school. I want to read the introduction and the first paragraph of the first chapter, and I can tell you whether that book is worth buying or not. Let me share this in closing. A number of years ago, a young man that had affiliated with our church, green as grass, but zealous in the Lord. One Wednesday evening he came in and was very, very downhearted. He said, Pastor, I need to talk with you. I said, what on earth is wrong? He said, I just left Winn-Dixie. I was in there getting some food items, and I saw this man in a wheelchair. And I went over to him and asked him if I could pray for him. He said, I laid hands on him. I prayed for him. I commanded that the evil spirit leave him and that he get up and walk. And he didn't. He said, why? I said, son, who have you been listening to? Who have you been reading behind? And he named some of the authors. I said, bring those books to me. The following service, he bought, brought three brown grocery bags full of books. I went through those, and I said, you can keep these too. He said, what are you going to do with the rest of them? I said, we're going to burn them, put them in the garbage can. He was reading behind false teachers with false theology and false doctrine. Can God heal? Yes. Will God? Yes. Many times, God chooses not to. The apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. The scripture says three times he said, God, heal me, heal me, heal me. Three times God said, no, 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 but my grace is sufficient for you. Multitudes of times we fall into the position of reading behind or listening to false teachers, false doctrine, false theology, which will destroy our lives, spiritually speaking. Would you stand, please?